Hi guys, it is a sweltering hot summer day in early April here in uh, Austin, Texas here on in the year 2019, early April 2019, but we're going to head up to what I hope is the cool and pleasant Rochester, New York, where I have the great pleasure and honor of finally speaking with uh, Adam Frank, and you're probably familiar somewhat if you're a listener to NPR or a reader of the New York Times with Adam. I'll just give you a little bit of background because I want to get into talking. Uh, Adam is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester where he studies the processes that shape the formation and death of stars and has become a leading expert on the final stages of evolution for stars like the Sun. And we're not going to be going there as much as I would love to talk to him about that. Uh, you probably know Adam as uh, a commentator on NPR's Cosmos and Culture blog, as well as a regular on-air commentator for All Things Considered. He contributes occasionally to the New York Times and the Atlantic, which we're going to talk about. His most recent book from just a few months ago is titled Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds and the Fate of the Earth, which explores a new vision for climate change and the human future by placing them both in their proper astrobiological context. So anyway, that was a mouthful. I could go on and on with this, guys, but we're going to bring Adam Frank on. Adam, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're just going to dive right in to this conversation. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here to have a chance to chat. Okay, so let us... Uh, what we're going to be chatting about, Adam, obviously, with a with a YouTube channel named Collapse Chronicles. We're going to be chatting about Collapse, the possibilities of that happening and ways to avoid it. And we're going to stick right here on our own home planet, the blue planet, with our own species here in the early years of the 21st century looking forward to the uh, balance of this century and what I want to, out of everything that I've enjoyed reading of yours, we're going to really, really center in on your models of the way collapse could or could not play out over the balance of the century. But before we get into those models, I want to talk about population biology and energy harvesting as a lead-in to these models of where we're going as a civilization. So take it away, Adam Frank, and educate us on population biology. Let's start right there. Well, the story of this whole project begins, remarkably, with uh, Jared Diamond's collapse, um, which I'm sure you, know, you guys are familiar with uh, and, you know, um, you know, uh, probably, you know, talked about. So, you know, that book was really interesting. Uh, you know, it came out like, what, 2005? Yeah. And, you know, it, it was, when I really, when I read that book, what really took me was this idea that, like, you know, he looked at a lot of different civilizations, right? And and the civilizations, I think the subtitle is How Civilizations uh, Choose to see, to Fail or Succeed. So, you know, he looked like, he looked at the Mayans, he looked at the, um, the Norse uh, in Greenland, um, of course, Easter Island, the, the Ur example. And that book, you know, I thought a lot about that book. And it was that book, along with my astronomical inclinations, that got me thinking that, you know, what's happening with climate change has to be a generic kind of thing, right? So I know you want to keep this pinned to Earth, but we can't talk about my work without yeah. sort of the astrobiological part because I'm an astronomer. Um, so, you know, what I started thinking about was the idea that, and this also came from my work with NPR, was that uh, climate change, we really look at climate change wrong. We sort of look at climate change and everybody's running around like with their chicken head, ch uh, chicken with a head cut off as, as sort of like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Why, is this happening, right? When you talk to climate denialists, it's always like you have to convince them that this is happening when in fact, 
once you come to understand planets the way we now, you know, humanity understands planets from, you know, going to Mars, going to Venus, seeing all these other worlds, you understand that, you know, we should have expected the Anthropocene, right? We should have expected climate change. Like if, if we landed or if aliens landed in Rome, you know, in ancient Rome 2,000 years ago, knowing what we know now about how planets work, you know, how, how climate works, they would have looked around and been like, you guys are going to trigger climate change in 2,000 years, right? It's uh, climate change, you know, the Anthropocene, right? Let's stop talking about climate change for a minute. Talk about the Anthropocene, which is the this idea that we're entering a human-dominated era in terms of how the planet functions. It's a, it's, it's, it's a natural consequence of a biosphere, you know, which is the sum totality of life on a planet, generating an energy-harvesting planet, or energy-harvesting civilization. So let's talk about that second one. What is, what do I mean by energy harvesting, right? So what we, if you look over the long course of uh, Earth's evolution, you see the Earth has been many different kinds of planet, right? There was a period when we were a water world before we ever generated, um, uh, before the climate, uh, the continents really grew. And there was a period when we were an ice world where pretty much the Earth was entirely glaciated. And then there was another period when we were a jungle planet for, you know, uh, tens of millions of years where there wasn't, you know, there was virtually no ice and snow on the entire planet. And throughout almost all of these transitions or many of these transitions, life was a principal driver or was played a huge role in, in configuring the state of that planet. So the, the Ur example of this uh, uh, is um, the uh, the only reason we have oxygen in the atmosphere right now is because of the blue-green bacteria, the evolution of blue-green bacteria, and their evolutionary innovation of the kind of photosynthesis they did, which was uh, used water as a background and then split off the oxygen, breathed out the oxygen in the process of uh, doing photosynthesis. So there's a species that 2.5 billion years ago completely changed the chemistry and future of the planet through its own activity. And here we are, two and a half billion years later, repeating uh, the blue, living like blue-green algae, doing the same thing. Exactly. So, like, there's a way. So, so you know, when I talk about uh, energy harvesting species, I mean a species through their technological advancements are able to, you know, greatly multiply the amount of energy in, uh, available per individual. Right. So, you know, if you're blue green algae 2.5 billion years ago, you basically get one blue green algae's worth of energy per day. Think of it like in terms of horsepower. Every horse gets one horsepower. Yeah. <laughs> Every human being without, you know, in, in uh, three million years ago or two million. Well, actually, there weren't any human beings. Then. So um, uh, 200,000 years ago, when human beings, homo, homo sapiens were first uh, evolved, every human being got one human being power. When the, with the birth of civilization, and by that I mean particularly uh, agriculture, 9,000 years ago, we started to ramp up how much energy each person had available. Until you get to the um, you get to the industrial revolution with fossil fuels, and now I, I did this calculation once. Each of us has, at least in just our homes, just in our homes, each of us has the equivalent of about 50 servants working for us, just from electricity, right? Just your, the amount of power that you are using each day from just your home, forget about your car or your airplane trips, is between 50 and 100 human beings working for you, right? So energy, and where does that energy come from? It comes from the planet, right? It either comes in the form of stored solar energy in fossil fuels, or maybe it comes from, you know, if you got solar collectors on your roof or, or you know, hydroelectric, but either way, a, a a technological civilization is fundamentally a mechanism for harvesting energy from the planet, right? And putting it to work for the good of civilization, right? For, for lifting things, for building buildings, building roads, maintaining them and such. So if we wanna talk about the evolution of a planet and a civilization, the first thing we have to do is understand energy harvesting, right? That that is the, that is the fundamental activity of a civilization. Every other part is just sort of details of culture. You know what I mean? So, okay, so that's the energy harvesting part, right? So that's the first part. If you wanna think about planets and civilizations evolving together, the first thing you gotta do is the energy harvesting part. Because that's what, the important part of that is how that is going to affect the planet, right? The idea is by harvesting the energy and using it 
there's a, a very important law of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, which says when you take energy and do work with it, some of the energy is always wasted, right? Some of the energy always turns into heat, or you can think of it as waste, right? And this has consequences beyond just heat. It's also chemical. There's a kind of chemical waste. Um, you, can, you can think of the greenhouse effect as being a consequence for human beings of our use of fossil fuels or use of any kind of energy. Okay, so that's the, import, the first important part is energy harvesting and its effect on the planet. The second part is energy harvesting and its effect on the population, on your civilization, right? Because if you want to mm. model the interaction of a planet and a civilization, what happens to the civilization? Well, on its most basic level, whether we're talking about human beings or Klingons or anything, what do human beings do with that energy? They make more babies, right? Exactly. Yeah. The only reason we're able to have 7 billion people on the planet right now is because of how much energy we, we use, right? We take that energy and we use it to make food, right? The, the green revolution of the 60s and 70s. Um, we use it to be able to prolong our lifetimes. You know, no matter how you slice it, we, we, the more energy use means more babies. And that falls under the rubric of a, of a field called population biology or population dynamics, where you can write down equations for um, how a population will change based on its birth rate and its death rate. And you calculate the birth and death rate, that's your model, that's you know, you're gonna put in whatever details you think are important. And so uh, those are the two elements, right, the, uh, that we need in order to model how a civilization, and again, I'm interested in any civilization. I'm interested in a civilization on the other side of the, the galaxy. I don't care. What I'm really interested in is just in generically how civilizations and planets evolve together. So the two things you need is to think about energy harvesting and its effect on the planet, and you need to think about energy harvesting and its effect on the population. How's that? There you go. So the, these are, this is essentially what you fed into your computer models to come up with your three outcomes. Uh, I'm gonna, obviously, I'm going to get you to go in into this deeper. I just want to read uh, just a couple of sentences from, um, I, I think this is from an Atlantic Magazine article, and then you can uh, flesh this out for us. So what did the models tell us? We saw three distinct kinds of civilizational histories. The first, and alarmingly the most common, was what we called, quote, the die-off. As the civilization used energy, its numbers grew rapidly, but the use of the resources, you know, to produce and use that energy also pushed the planet away from the conditions the civilization grew up with, and as the evolution of the civilization and planet continued, the population skyrocketed, blowing past the planet's limits. The population, in other words, overshot the planet's carrying capacity. Now this, Adam Frank, is, is probably, uh, if, I would say at least 50% of the guests that I have had on, that I have interviewed, very smart people who know a lot more about this subject than I ever will, this is the, the scenario they say is clearly uh, playing out on, on this planet. And I see here the most common. So uh, let's talk about the die-off uh, scenario for uh, what's going to happen on the balance of this century. Why was it the most common and is this the one you particularly see happening in our own future? Well, okay, so let's talk about how that, so the, you know, these models, so first of all, it's very important for you to understand that um, the, we were, these models were the first cut at this project, right? So it's, you know, it's an ambitious project. I want to model the uh, interaction between a planet and a civilization generically, right? Because I, you know, one of the, part of my research is about uh, what I call exo-civilizations, right? We now know that every star you see in the sky has planets orbiting them, every star. So, you know, there are planets all over the universe. And, you know, most of them, or many of those planets, are in the right place for life to form. So, you know, from my perspective, as I said, the anthrop what we're going through now is a generic cosmic phenomenon. Civilizations 
are, you know, even if you're pessimistic about how often they happen, there's still been a lot of them, most likely. And my argument is that all of them go through an Anthropocene. There's like really kind of no way, if you're building a technological civilization, for you to not push your planet into the kind of conditions that we're going into. So that means that, you know, this mod, so that's a pretty ambitious project. I'm trying to figure out how to do this in a generic way without, you know, I don't want the details of human beings, how we act or what kind of, you know, economics we use. So it's important for people to understand that we were, this, this was a first cut at this and we used a very, uh, you know, it was a sketch. The mathematics was very simplified in terms of the yeah. interactions. We were just trying to get a sense of, and this is the beauty of mathematical modeling. You know, you put together something, you know, we had an equation for the population. We had an equation for the, uh, the planet's temperature. You could think of it that way. They were coupled together. You know, like the, the equations had were such that changes in the population produced changes in the temperature. Changes in the temperature produced changes in the population. So these equations were our first attempt to get a sense of at least, you know, rather than just arguing about it, right, having people say one thing, to let the models tell us how for a simplified form of interaction, what kind of behavior is there, right? Um, so what we found was that, and this is, this is expected with, always with population biology, if you have a lot of resources available, your population will always grow exponentially, right? Unless you've got something stopping it. Popul <laughs> exponential population growth is always, you know, if there, if there are no predators and there are no, you know, if, there, if you haven't, you know, if you're not anywhere close to the limits of your growth, you're going to grow exponentially. So now the important thing is, how is your planet responding to that exponential growth? So in the models, every baby that was born, you know, used a certain amount of energy, and that energy then would feed back on the temperature. Every time, you know, for every baby's worth of energy that was used, the planet's temperature got, got pushed, yeah. you know? And then what we did is, and here was the important point. So, um, we tied the planet's carrying capacity to the temperature, right? So, you know, the carrying capacity, I'm sure your audience knows this, but let's just, you know, go through it. The carrying capacity of an environment or of a planet is the number of individuals that that environment can, can, uh, can, can hold, right? The number of individuals that you can have of that species or that civilization uh, before, you know, you start, you know, before basically you run the limits of the growth and everybody just starts dying, right? So what we did is we tied the, the planet's carrying capacity to the temperature so that as the temperature increased, the carrying capacity decreased, which makes sense, right? If we blow past, you know, if we go to two degrees of, of global warming, we think things are going to be difficult, but we'll be able to deal with it. If we get to four degrees of global warming, wow, things are going to be bad and we expect the death toll to rise. If we get to eight degrees of warming, it's a different planet and it's yeah, not even yeah. clear that civilization, that our kind of civilization could maintain, right? So that was the idea. And uh, so in the, the, as we ran the models, what we would find was now, of course, there were parameters for the model, right? The, parameter, the parameters are things that you put in that, that um, sort of uh, uh, articulate aspects of how you think things are working. So, for example, we had a parameter that was, uh, that me or that not measured, that a parameter that determined the sensitivity of the planet, uh, you know, to each baby's birth, right? You know, so you can have some planets where, you know, depending on where the planet is in orbit, maybe you could burn all the fossil fuel that you wanted and it would take a long time before the planet would start to notice and have its temperature change. Whereas you could have a planet, which kind of looks like ours, um, where like, you know, you don't have to use much fossil fuel before the planet's state, the temperature begins to change. So that was a parameter. So as we varied these parameters, we saw different results. And as you said, the, I wouldn't say it was the most common. It wasn't overwhelmingly the most, you know, but, but it was you know, definitely the most common where... The population would start to rise exponentially. Um, depending Which is what on what we're seeing right now. Well, we have been seeing it exactly. for the past 200 years. Right, right. We have been, okay. every aspect of human civilization is rising exponentially. Uh, power use, economies, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the um, uh, population. Yeah, we are definitely in the Pocky exponential state, yeah, phase yeah. of growth. Uh, so then what would happen is if, if, you know, for certain, for a range of parameters like the planet sensitivity, the population would go, would very rapidly rise. The temperature would start to rise on the planet, you know, and you can think of the temperature as a proxy 
for this, the state of the planet, right? So the, the planet started to change in response to all the people that were being born and all the energy they were using. And so now the population skyrocketing, the temperature skyrocketing, and then it would happen so fast that you would very quickly get past the point in the temperature where the planet could carry that many numbers, that you know, that, that, that the numbers of, of, of individuals. And so the population would then self-correct you know, I mean, the death term in the population equation kicked in, you know, with the carrying capacity and the numbers, you know, the, the, you get a big peak in population and then it would come down pretty rapidly and then it would it would stabilize. Right. So so depending on the parameters, you would see, uh, you know, 70 percent of the population dying off. 50 percent, you know, which is pretty dramatic, like if if, every, if half the people on the planet disappeared in the next you know, 30 years, uh, that may, may be very whole, hard to hold civilization together if that now, happens. Are your models suggesting that on any level, uh, that half no, the population? We, didn't have, we, couldn't, we couldn't model that. We weren't modeling that kind of social interaction. Yeah, All yeah, we yeah. found was that the, uh, uh, that the population and the uh, temperature eventually stabilized, right? So, so after this overshoot, you would come down to, say, a population that was 30% the peak of the yeah. you know of the peak value but now it was stable it didn't change anymore with time and the temperature also stabilized so you know you went through a big die off but you at least ended up in a place where the numbers weren't changing anymore but that's making a big uh, a big assumption adam that the not, not not even bringing the the the, the temperature going on uh, on its own uh, regardless of how many people judging how many feedbacks we unleash uh but you're going under the assumption that once we get down to 30% of the population that we're just just going to stay there without making the same mistake all over again and, and coming right back up. How did you account well, no, for no, that? That's, that's the beauty of the models, right? The mo <laughs> There's no assumption in the models, right? I mean, the mo you know, so that mo the, the, the same mathematics which drove the uh, population up to you know its peak and caused the, the overshoot is the mathematics that brought it down to a stable level. There's no more assumptions in it, right? So, you know, so to the degree that, now of course, you know, these are very simplified models, right? Because, I mean, to me, it's not clear that, you know, if you lost 70% of your population that you'd be able to hold a civilization like ours together. But that's not in the models, right? But, but when it comes to the just, what the models showed was that they showed is you, you will have this overshoot, and you can then afterwards reach a, you know, the, the population and the planet re can reach a stable configuration. Do we have any real life on Earth models of other species that we can see a, an example of this that you're aware of? Or is that kind oh, of out right. of your uh, Yeah, sure. This actually, uh, that's again, you know, the beauty of this, you know, th th this, uh, these equations, they're actually, the, they were first formulated in the 1930s um, by, well, there, was, there was an American uh, biologist and a Italian biologist. And they, their first version of it was, um, uh, that what they were looking at was predator and prey, the interactions between predators and prey, so like wolves and bunnies yeah. in a forest, or um, uh, sharks and uh, fish, you know, a, yeah. a, a, a catch fish. Um, and, you know, so that's the, it's called the predator-prey model. And yet, it, you know, the, the general, these equations work very well. You know, they, 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 they do a beautiful job of, of predicting populations uh, in the wild, you know. So now, of course, we're adapting them to this whole other thing. But if you're asking just in general, you know, can you use these equations to model the uh, interaction between a population and an environment? Yeah. You know, that's why they're, they're, they're so awesome. But again, I mean, your, your point is well taken in the sense that, you know, there's things that are not in the model, which is, yeah, would a civilization even hold together? If you um, uh, uh, if you could, you know, if you if you lost that many that much of your population, well, certainly the 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 those of us quote left behind uh, to, to borrow a phrase from from other groups out there are, are going to be looking at a much reduced level of uh, of lifestyle. Uh, I mean it, that that almost just. Uh, again, it's probably beyond the purview of, of your models, but yeah. that just seems yeah. like it would be just an, an assumption uh, that that's 
Do you, do you well, have any possible. comments on I that? Mean, the, you know, the, the interesting thing about the, I mean, if we just take these models seriously, just for what they are, what you could imagine that these models predict is like, right, there's this, there's this very difficult period when, um, you know, the, the population is coming down, right? When you're getting these big, the, the die off itself, right? But that given the fact that the, the, you end up with still a sizable population, right? Half of seven billion yeah, yeah, is yeah. five billion. That's a lot of people. And if you have a stable population with that kind of energy use, you know, maybe what it means is instead of everybody getting to live like Americans, everybody gets to live like Italians, you know, who basically have smaller houses and everybody doesn't get a car and everybody doesn't fly everywhere, you know. So, you know, it's possible those models are predicting a, a smaller population with a, a smaller energy footprint, put, footprint, but not necessarily we're living like cavemen or Mad Max, you know. Uh, so there's so, some good news. There could be good news in 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 though in that class of models. Well, let's st st stick with this one for just a few more minutes. Then we're going to move over to the to the other two uh, the the other two the, choices. The other two are the good news and and the, the bad really news. bad news. Uh, <laughs> th th this is so you. you I think you just mentioned the word bottleneck. If you didn't, I'll mention it for you. This is, uh, in this model, look, looking at the real world historical data that, that's clearly evident, uh, certainly over the last 30 years, if not the 100 years, last 100 years, there, there's, a, again, a lot of intelligent people say we are right now as a global industrial civilization entering this bottleneck. Uh, yeah. And the, the, it is the next few decades that we and certainly our children and grandchildren are going to understand what this bottleneck looks like and find out whether yeah. we are coming through the other side. Do you have any personal... Uh, uh, do you have do you, do you have any any personal feelings on whether we are in fact entering this bottleneck that this model predicts, uh, or how close to to that bottleneck I, are no, we? I agree. I do think that. I mean, now again, you know, I'm going to be agnostic between the three models, but I think you know, I think these neck. I agree that we're definitely we're at we're in the bottleneck. We're you know, we're, we're just. That's why I try and tell everybody. You know, when I talk about climate change with people. You know, I just did a review of that book, Uninhabitable Earth, um, for NPR, yeah. and I, you know, I thought that one of the most important parts of that book was the recognition that we're already down the road, you know, quite a ways in terms of, you know, it's a different planet. We're we're going to be living on a different planet. It's not, you know, we're it's never going to be what it used to be, including the things that we grew up with, you know, sort of just taking for granted in the kind of lifestyle we live. So yeah, I would definitely agree that you know these next the next century or so is going to be uh, we're in the bottleneck, and it'll, you know, our behavior during that was going to determine sort of where we end up with. You know, I love in um, what is it, the uh, the long emergency, which I'm sure you guys have talked about. Oh which yeah, very... I've interviewed Kotzler a couple of times. Yeah, no, I really I like that book, and that, that book was very influential for me as well. Um, you know, I talked about the idea that the next generation is going to be the heroic generation. Like, you know, it's our kids the... and our kids' kids who are really. They're the ones who are going to really have to work hard and face some real difficulty, unlike, you know, I'm 56 now and, um, you know, unlike my generation. So, yeah, you know, we're up for and we're going to see we're going to see, you know, we're going to see what kind of species we really are. Uh, we're really it's it's going to separate you know? the men from the boys. Uh, yeah, right. For, it's for, going to separate for, for the sure. smart aliens from the dumb aliens in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> you know, like what kind of species are we among, you know, among because, you know, for me, again, this is all about astrobiology. You know, when you look at the stars, there's, there's probably, you know, the, 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 this kind of thing's happening all the time. And there's those who make it, you know, through their Anthropocene moment. And there's those who end up on the trash pile of cosmic history. And that's what we are just about to find out, uh, <laughs> which pile we're in. Well, I, I, if we have time later, I, I, I might want to touch on the whole Fermi's paradox of uh, uh, right. Of that, whether or not every single industrial civilization has ended up on the trash uh, and the trash pile of their own creation, well, like, but we, why don't we pick this up? Because actually, you know, there's like a, there's two more solutions. 
to the you know the classes of solution. Let's go to the good solution. Well, let's well let's uh, 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 okay. Give us the the. But I I, I want to finish out this discussion too. But go ahead and oh. and, and get to the good news uh, model that that it's not entirely out of uh, out of the realm of possibility that there is a good uh, some good news at the end of these models depending on how we tweak the variables. So give us the right. good news one and then we'll go to the really really bad one. Really bad news. So you know I mean the interesting thing about this is you can, you know right so as we started to become aware of climate change over the last half century you know, we've, we've entered into this discussion about sustainability, right? We recognize that we have to build a sustainable version of our civilization, and the one we have right now is not sustainable. Um, but so, you know, here's a really interesting question. Like, how do you know the universe does that, right? You know, the universe makes a lot of stuff. There's comets, and there's, you know, black holes, and there's, you know, gas clouds. And, uh, so, but how do we know a long-term sustainable version of a technological civilization is one of the things that the universe does? Like maybe everybody gets 200 years and then you're gone, right? And um, there's no way, you know, when we ask the question about sustainability, I think this was a really important question to ask. Do we even really know what we're shooting for and if it exists? The lovely thing about our models is that, you know what? Out of the math, without us tweaking anything, you know, there's a one whole class of solution which appeared a lot which was the population goes through exponential increase. Yeah. The temperature goes through exponential increase. Yeah. But you reach stability. So, you know, it just, it's a soft landing. You go through the, it's, they call it the sigmoid because it looks like an S. You know, it rises quickly and then it curves over and there's no die off. You just reach a stable population. And a sta the planet's changed, right? The temperature is, has now increased. You're, you're in a different planet than you started with, but not a, not a planet that can't sustain, you know, a reasonable population. So that was a real surprise, right? That was like, oh, hiding in these models is the answer to that question about whether or not it's even possible. The answer is, yeah, it's possible. Did any of those models suggest that seven and a half billion heading to 10 billion is, is either stable or sustainable? I mean, yeah, I, no, we didn't. The, the, that the model could not answer that question. Like that rule <laughs> require a right. So where we are, I mean, it's a big question about where we are on that. Um, but yeah, so that absolutely that is not that was not enough. You know, that, that the model, as we would say, is, is not tuned to Earth. It's generic. Yeah, uh, it's t t tuned to Jupiter. Maybe, maybe, maybe if Earth was the size of Jupiter, or if I said if we were if we were the size of cockroaches, maybe uh, may maybe we could. Uh, uh, but but I just, I, I mean I I'm not I don't want to sit here and, and argue with the with a great mind. You know I'm just I'm just looking at it. You know, just from my perspective, I just don't. I mean, assuming this one is available, that that, that there's no way that 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 we're that we're going to reach that uh, outcome with the present population. I uh, e even. Yeah. Right. No, no, I agree. I mean, you know, what I can hope. I mean, but, you know, what's interesting, so I've had this conversation with a lot of people and, you know, in the discussion about population and, you know, uh, but as a number of, of people who I really respect have pointed out, you know, it's not really the size of your population. It's the size of the average energy consumption. Yeah. You know, like if you could get everybody's energy consumption on average down to like an Italian. It's like, you know, so Italy is the, I don't know why we choose Italy, but Italy is just, you know, what's interesting, there's this really interesting plot uh, uh, that the uh, World Health Organization does, and it's happiness versus energy use. And you define happiness by like literacy and, you know, uh, child mortality and everything. And what you find is if like you have really, if you have access to no energy, you know, life is really terrible, right? Yeah. Um, and if you have access to infinite amounts of energy, you know, you're a lot happier. But what they find is, is that there's like, there's a place where basically, at, like, after you get to the, the uh, energy level of Italians, which is like really quite a bit less than we have, the happiness curve yeah. flattens, you know? So that like, if, if you have twice as much energy as Italians, on average, you're not any happier than the Italians. If you have four times as much energy as the Italians, you're not any happier than the Italians. So like, is it possible that, you know, obviously we can't have 100 billion people on the planet, 
But maybe like we could have three billion on the people people on the planet and have just you know everybody gets less en- enough energy to have you know be literate and have your baby survive and have a long life and take an airplane trip you know once or twice in a lifetime um uh and, and maybe that that would be sustainable so it may not be just population it's how much energy you know each member on average of that population gets oh yeah it's cert- it's certainly the uh at least a two-headed snake and and, and don't yeah. forget technology we you know paul ehrlich always reminds me people always forget the t in the ipad equation uh so but, but before we move on to to the really bad news and then we'll talk <laughs> then we'll think of a couple of other things to talk about you personally, and, and be be honest here, uh, Adam. You personally, how optimistic looking at the various models in front of you, particularly with the, the, the opening up the mainstream media news every day. I guess including Rolling Stone magazine today, and 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 and, and reading how things are getting so much worse, so much faster than we thought. Yeah. Are you as op- well? Tell us your level of, of optimism and, and pessimism. Are you more optimistic or pessimistic than I, than, than when you first came up with these models? I've never asked you when the year that you actually ran this experiment. Have you become well, more pessimistic? Year, yeah, we did it last year. Oh, just a year ago. So okay, okay. Let's go back one year. I, I know I've become more pessimistic in the last year, uh, Adam Frank. Uh, h- how about you? Well, you know, it's interesting. Like, so, you know, I, I, when the book came out and I was, you know, doing all the press and everything, people would always ask me that question, you know, how, and I used to, you know, my, what I always say is like, well, I'm optimistic because what's the alternative, you know? Um, and it was interesting. And, you know, as a scientist, I, 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 I you know, I marvel at humanity's uh, capacity for invention and its capacity for for um, creativity. So there's a certain way that, you know, I'm optimistic in the sense that, like, I think things are going to get bad, but I also think, I think we're going to muddle through. And then I think we're going to be able to, you know, because there's a certain way, when you think about it, nobody changes unless there's a gun to their head, so to speak, right? There and is that, a you know, gun we, to we, our head. Yeah, and there is one, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we are poised. We are poised. So here's the interesting thing. Okay. We are poised to become, I mean, we're just right on the lip of it, of becoming a multi-planet species, right? If we make it through climate change, in another 200 years, say, you know, which is not that long, right? 200 years ago, people were wearing stovepipe hats and, you know, wearing clothes that didn't look that much different from what I'm wearing now. Um, 200 years from now, easy money, we could have... You know, we can have the same number of people living on Mars as a very large city, in a, you know, in, in the world. You can have a you know, you can have 100 million people living on Mars, as well as the asteroids. And, you know, we're just at the lip of that list. Stuff that's going on with SpaceX, what they call new space, the commercial development of space, means that we're just poised to make this unbelievably exciting step, you know, outward. And so uh, it's interesting that just at the moment when we're able to take that step, we also face this real dilemma about becoming a true planetary species. Because to make it through the Anthropocene, you have to fully and finally recognize yourself as a planetary species, right? You can't have this illusion anymore that like, oh, I don't really care, I don't have to care about the planet, it doesn't matter, I can throw my garbage anywhere, you know. You have to truly self you see yourself as part of a biosphere that is you know, a single organism in some sense. So, you know, that, that makes me optimistic. But on the other hand, um, you know, I, when I, I did a, I did a, uh, an interview with one guy who was Christopher Hitchens, who was a, who was yeah. a war correspondent. He's a um, big, yeah. And, and afterwards he said to me, you know, when he asked this question, he said, you know, when I was traveling, I think it was, it was during the Bosnian war. And he said, you know, the people who were the most pessimistic were the ones who survived, right? If you were optimistic <laughs> about what was at the, at the end of that hill, you know, uh, about what weapon system was at the end of that hill, you know, there was a good chance you were going to die. So, you know, I, I took I was like, oh, that's something to think about. But on the other hand, you know, we're talking about the whole species. So I think I think some form of optimism is really important uh, because because we're going to create our own future. You know what I mean? That's what human beings do. And I think we're, we're probably yeah, there's no doubt it's going to be a rough time. But I think I think we're going to be able to make it, you know. 
Okay, so we we will uh, if we if we have time at the very end, we'll 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 come come back to this. But I'm uh, I'm glad you had time to get that in. But let's go on uh, for now to uh, number three. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, no, number three on the list, uh, and that is the. Uh, just, just the absolute uh, hitting the wall, and uh, we're not just the civilization going extinct, but the uh, the whole species going extinct. Yeah. Uh, where are you? T tell us about that model. Yeah. So that model was interesting, and it was interest. You know, I mean, it was interesting from a scientific perspective because. It showed the dangers of the nonlinearity of the system. So, you know, in physics, we describe systems about how, like, you know, if you, about how the way the system, the way different systems are coupled together. And if a system is linearly coupled to another system, you push on it and the other system responds kind of with like a, 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 a an equal push, you know, or an equal change, or at least something that scales with the push. A nonlinear change is where you make a little teeny tiny change and the other system blows up. Right. You know, so nonlinearities are always the thing that bites you. And that's what uh, you we're know, in that, right now, right? What? That's what we're in right now is a nonlinear system and yeah, getting more you know, so every year. Civilization. Yes. Yeah, you know, civilizations and planets by themselves, you know, each one individually is a highly coupled nonlinear system. So put them together and you get a highly, highly, highly nonlinear coupled system. And so the interesting thing about the collapse models was that they showed the fact of how the nonlinearity played a role. So, for example, you know, we built a, 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 a knob in the models to allow the the species to recognize that they had that they were driving this you know planetary change and to switch from one energy mode to another, where like the first energy mode was very uh, impactful, like um, uh, fossil uh, fuels. Fossil fuels. Thank you. <laughs> and what we found was this was amazing. Is that you know, you could watch that switch and you'd see the, the you'd see the, the, what appeared to be, after you made the switch, the exponential growth start to taper off. And like, yeah, and it looked like, oh, look, we're heading towards stability. And then, bam, the population would, would drop, you know, because the temperature would suddenly go up. And what that showed was that the, 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 the simulation, or sorry, the, the, the system was nonlinear in that it had kind of a memory of what was happening and stuff was kind of trickling through it. You know, even though it looked, and so for a while, even though it looked like things were getting better, you know, the, the, the effects of the population rise and the energy use were trickling through the system and just a little bit later triggered the, the, you know, the, the runaway temperature increase and then the, the, collapse, the complete collapse. Well, clearly, the, uh, I, yeah, as you were saying earlier, so much of it uh, right now uh, depends on where, just the global temperature is going uh, and if it hits a certain uh, spot whether that be four or five you know at some point we just cannot survive as, as biological organisms well I think that that part okay so I've had a like you know my, my friend Jason Wright who's an astrobiologist and I uh, get into this argument all the time so eight degrees human beings could still survive on eight degrees because the planet's been eight degrees warmer before you know and there's With been lots of organisms what? With humans on it? Uh, not with humans on it, but with human <laughs> creatures whose biology was pretty similar to yeah. humans, right? Dinosaurs, you know, or, you know, I mean, so it's not like the last big temperature increase was the PETM, the, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. And I think the temperature in Fahrenheit was like 15 degrees higher. And, you know, there were a lot, a lot of creatures running around. It was a jungle planet, basically. I kind of like that jungle planet uh, look, whatever I see renderings of it. I say, you know, that looks pretty cool to me, actually. I know, right? <laughs> so this is an interesting question. Like, what, you know, so I don't think, I mean, for the species to really die out, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's asking a lot, you know? I can imagine the civilization just completely crumbling. I could imagine our numbers going down to, like, you know, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, you know, or so. Like if, if you really can't keep technology going and you're really broken up, I could see, you know, that human population would be back to, we spend maybe say tens of millions, we'd be in scattered groups across the planet with very little technology. But, you know, I, it's hard for me to see us dying entirely, you know, if, from, from what would the kind of things we're driving, like just being driven completely extinct. 
But, you know, but, you know, actually, here's an important thing from the point of view of those models. You know, if we went from 7 billion to 1 million, yeah. that's essentially extinct. You know what I mean? Like, even if there were a million human beings left, your population has dropped by a factor of, you know, what would that be? You know, uh, you know more than a uh, thousand or 10,000. So, you know, that's almost like, you know, when you think about the curve, unless you're plotting it in log scale, you know, you're not even going to see that anymore in the curve. So, you know, one can ask, one can say that, that, you know, a really, a really, really dramatic die off, you know, leading to this utter collapse of civilization. If we had an utter collapse of civilization, you would not, yeah, you know, our numbers would definitely be below a billion, right? We didn't cross a billion until like mid 1800s. Yeah, so it's that only was, going back. It's not going back that far, it's what people don't realize. It really right. isn't turning the clock back very, very far. You know, before the before the dawn of quote unquote civilization, right? And again, I always thought what I mean by that is always agriculture. When we started, when we domesticated ourselves, there were there were less people, less human beings on the planet than there are now in a small sized city. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. That is, you, think, you know. So uh, you so you are not a. I don't know what the word is. Not not fan is the is the wrong word. But you you are not predicting the worst case worst case scenario a, a total collapse resulting in the extinction of the human race and probably pretty much every other earthling we share the planet with. Uh, you no, you no, personally no, no. don't see that. that. You know, one of my messages when it comes to the planet. And, you know, we, 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 we're, this is not a, the, what we're going through is not about saving the planet. The planet's going to be just yeah. fine. Thank you very much. You know, because what the planet, you know, that's I, like our job here is not to save the earth. It's to keep from pissing it off, you know, <laughs> basically, because, you know, the planet was just the planet churns through species, you know. And if we're not, you know, if we're dumb, which, you know, we can be pretty dumb. The planet is just going to be like, thank you very much for the climate change. I'm going to use that to generate some new interesting species. I bet it will. You know? Let's before, good Lord, you realize we are 47 minutes into this. We, we've got yeah, 10 minutes of the absolute. Right. I just really wanted to touch uh, on a subject with you, and then then we'll uh, head to Mars at the, at the end of this. But before we head to Mars, I just want the, the, this, what is your... I know you don't like to talk about the worst case scenario, but if we do completely collapse and eventually we're going out, what is your vision of what we are going to leave behind in the geological record? What's it going to look like 10 million, 100 million years from now if someone's digging around in the rubble? Are, are we going to be a quarter inch thick layer of, of plastic? What What is your vision about this? I've, I've always been well, we, fascinated. There's a, for, we, I wrote a paper with Gavin Schmidt, who, you know, the, the great climatologist Gavin Schmidt, exactly about this problem. Though we were asking, we were asking the freaky deaky question of if there was, and there's an Atlantic, another Atlantic article on this. Yeah, um, I, I, I have it. In, I have it in front of me. I, I was I, simply, simply because of time, I, I didn't even want to open up that rabbit hole. Yeah, I would I love. love so well, we need to just simply for the matter of time, we need to stick to the the, the question. As much as I know, we we would both love to dive into that one. Uh, let let let's so, stick that, with this one. What will our geological record look like right. when we go? That really what that record was was an exercise in asking the question of what is you know what what are what are we or any civilization going to leave, leave behind? And, and the remarkable thing is, after about three million years. You know, yeah. uh, there ain't, there, you, there's not going to be iPhones, you know, there's <laughs> not gonna be buildings, there's not going to be, you know, the, the surface of the earth is overall re, you know, re, you know, uh, resurfaced yeah. pretty much after, certainly after 10 million years, yeah. you know, there's just, you're not going to find buildings, you're not, you might be able to find mines, you know, because mines are, but even, you know, there, there's movement of the plates that are enough that yeah. probably the mines would close up. So the only thing you're going to see is, as you said, there's going to be, there's going to be a layer that is going to have isotopic anomalies in it. Um, you know, where you're, if you look at uh, oxygen 18 or carbon 13, or may, maybe you might find plastic residues, you know, small, super small beads of plastic. Um, but in general, you're not going to see any physical evidence, physical, you know, artifacts. What you're going to see is that th there are going to be chemical tracers of like something weird happened here. You know, something weird happened in this era. 
that you know like the yeah the 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 the, the oxygen shot up and the carbon shot down and all that was indicative of like kind of you know the temperature changes and you know we you might even find be able to find uh, in the in the rock strata steroids you know st non non natural steroids in there because we have a, you know so that's the only thing that's going to be around there's not going to be any you know tum tumbled buildings or anything the good? earth in Go ahead. Sorry. Any human bones? Like, we have dinosaur. I mean, is there going to be any biological evidence of what we look like? I mean, us naked apes. Are, 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 I mean, our bones are so tight. We're like a toenail to a yeah. brontosaurus rex. I mean, are, even, are, are any of our bones going to be here for the Fossil future bone diggers? Fossilization, I mean, okay, so this is, I am not a geologist, and I don't play one on TV. So, you know, uh, but when we, you know, I, I, when we were writing the paper, we passed it through a bunch of, you know, I, tried, I talked to a bunch of uh, geologists and paleontologists, and the thing about, you know, 99% of all living creatures do not get fossilized, you know? We don't have a fossil record of the entire, you know, flora and fauna that we're, yeah, born, you know, yeah. we're born on. So the odd, especially if we're very short-lived, you know, the, the shorter lived you are as a species, the less possibility something is going to fossilize. So it's entirely conceivable that, no, there won't be any human bo you know, bones fossilized or not enough to be easily found. You know, uh, so, yeah, there's not, you know, and, it's, and certainly our technological artifacts after 10 million yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you know are gone? You know they'll just be pressed into the earth and reduced back to their you know their their atoms in many ways. Okay, well I just want I just wanted to touch on that, but we are good Lord, We are fifty two minutes into this, so Adam Frank, uh, I, I'm going to let you. I I, I, I I don't talk much about the going to Mars thing, but but give us your your three minute spiel. Are humans do you honestly believe, Adam Frank, uh, and you know a lot more about this subject than me, do you honestly believe that we are going to get off of, uh, of this planet, or are we going down with the ship? Uh, we're getting off this planet. I mean, I'm not, you know, there's no plan, there's no, there's no planet B, you know. Um, I mean, Mars, you know, it's going to be a long time before Mars could ever support a you know very large population but i have no doubt that you know if we may that's I, I what i like to always say is that the prize uh, you know at the end of the rainbow for us dealing with the anthropocene is space and i don't mean interstellar because it's ve the stars are so far away it's not at all clear to me that you could actually yeah. that's going to be that we're going to do that but the solar system for sure if we make it and the, you know if you if we make it you come back the, the, you know if we make it the next 10,000 years of human evolution is going to be played out across the stage of the solar system, and it's going to be freaking awesome. So that's why we got to make it. Okay, I guess we will know in, uh, in, in 10,000 years. I don't think we're going to have to wait that long. But, uh, okay, a a Adam, I, I want you to stick around after we hang up just so we can close out, m me and sure. you. But for, for the record, uh, as... I end every one of my Collapse Chronicles interviews. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but you actually uh, had Tucker Carlson uh, sticking a microphone in your face and giving you 60 seconds to give the Adam Frank message to planet Earth in 2019, what would your 60 second sound bite to the planet sound like, Adam Frank? Okay, here's the thing. All we right. should have expected climate change. You know, um, climate change is actually a measure of our success as a species. The Anthropocene is a measure of, uh, of uh, the end of our adolescence. And as we all know, adolescence is a dangerous transition. But if you make <laughs> it through with wisdom, you end up better off. So uh, we absolutely can make it, but we need to, we need to face up. We need to be adults and uh, see what's happening. All right, so we're gonna t we're gonna turn it over like my, my last guest uh, said. Uh, his his only comment was cheer on Greta Thunberg. That that was that was his comment to society. That is that it's gonna be up to the Greta Thunbergs to to figure this out because uh, we sure have made a mess of it. But yeah, any, right. Sorry. anyway, uh, again, just sit, stick around for a minute. Uh, but I just want to say for. Just for the record, I really uh, uh, appreciate you finding an hour 
uh, in your busy schedule, good Lord, brother, with the schedule that you must keep to find an hour of your time to come talk to us down in this weird little corner uh, of cyberspace. And it has been fun. I could do this all day. I hope we can do this again a year from now and see how things look to you then. But in the meantime, uh, keep up the good fight, brother. And Thank you very much, man. All right. Bye, guys.